Kia ora no. I'm Rachel. Welcome back to my channel uh, where I'm talking all about well-being and activism. You know, we're all out there doing the good work, trying to make a world that hurts less. And I want that for our movements too. I want them to hurt less. Uh, so with that in mind, today I am talking about this little gem of a book called Burnout. Um, the Secret to Solving the Stress Cycle by Emily and Amelia Nagoski. Uh, there's uh, so much in this book. It's not just for activists. Um, in fact, it's not aimed at activists. So stick around if you're not an activist and just want to hear something about stress. Um, it's actually aimed at women, which is one of the really lovely things about this book because it it um, shows the way that systems of inequality and oppression play out and impact on people in their lives and it gives real ways of dealing with those impacts right um, but the part that's most important about this book they say it themselves is the first chapter and that's relevant to everybody um, and that's about how stress works in our body and how we can respond to it uh, so what the basic argument is and it's this um this book is very, very clearly, simply, and easily written, which is really great. Uh, I'm tempted to read. They have these little bits in the back of each chapter that are, um, you know, too long, didn't read. And they're great little summaries. So I'm tempted just to read out those summaries, but I feel like that's cheating. Um, so I'll give, I'll, I'll give my own summary. Um, but their basic argument is that you need to separate stress, the, the actual stress response that you have in your body, from the stressor. So the stressor is anything that activates a stress response in your body. And the stress is that actual, um, that physiological response that's happening in your body. And so the reason that they say you need to separate these really clearly is that it's really easy to assume that if you deal with the stressor, um, then you've dealt with the stress. So they, they use that classic example that we've heard lots of times, you know, when people talk about stress, that our bodies are designed to respond to life-threatening uh, things that might happen in the natural world, uh, like, for example, being chased by a lion. And so, uh, you you know, it might obviously it's not usually a lion in our regular life. Usually, the things that feel threatening to us are things that. Uh, threaten our sense of identity or threaten our knowledge or our place in the group or um, just feel like we might fail or suggest that we've failed um, or lots of different things. So common stresses are family, work, uh, romantic relationships, uh, money, oppression, and then there's more sort of abstract internal things like self-criticism and the future, which is, I think, a huge one for all of us at the moment, right? So even those, thing, those things aren't necessarily life-threatening. Our body responds to them as though they are life-threatening. And so it drops anything else it would be doing otherwise, like digesting our food or um, repairing ourselves. And it gets ready to move muscles really fast. Um, or just not necessarily fast, but moving muscles like crazy, right? So that means blood pumping through the body, accelerated heart rate, um, and and as well as uh, as well as that, like those things that are making you ready to work, work, work like crazy, uh, physically work, work, work like crazy. Uh, there's also an endorphin rush that stops you from noticing how yucky all of this feels, which I think is a really interesting point, you know, that we can ignore stress for a long time because there's actually part of the stress activation that stops us from noticing that it doesn't feel that good to stay in that state uh, so all of that activates uh, but in our modern day world we we aren't dealing with something like a lion like if a lion was chasing us we would run away run back to our village uh, hopefully escape so let's assuming best case scenario if you like they say in the book if you don't make it then you don't have to deal with it, right? You're, you're gone. But if you do make it back to the village, 
everyone rushes out and helps kill the lion with you. Uh, yay, you're safe. It feels good. Um, the sun shines brighter and you can relax into your body as a safe place to be. And I think that's a wonderful phrasing that they use in this book about needing to do something that lets your body know that it's a safe place to be. So it can return to its other tasks like digesting food and working your immune system uh, and reproductive functioning, you know, like being able to experience arousal and romantic attraction, all those things. So, so what they're saying is that, you know, you can't just tell yourself that you're safe and it's fine. You need to do something that actually signals that to the body and releases all of the, the chemicals that are, that are making you move, you know, getting ready to move like crazy. And so they say in it that because, because your body's getting ready to run, essentially, that the most efficient way of dealing with the stress is to do physical activity, like run, um, or dance it out in your living room, or swim, or cycle, or whatever, whatever works for you. Now, one of the great things about the book is that they also give lots of other options. Um, so, yeah, exercise is the most effective way, but there's lots of other options for people who might have mobility issues, or just hate exercise, or for whatever reason, that's not going to work for you. Um, so some of the other things that they talk about are uh, kissing and cuddling, um, particularly nice long kisses and nice long cuddles. Um, they talk about creative expression because one of the things that they come back to again and again is that this is an emotional response in our bodies. And so if you can, um, if you're involved in some kind of creative expression that actually allows you to process and release those emotions, then that helps. Um, and also, it's interesting that they include, uh, so that's a creative expression thing, but it's interesting that they include in the physical part of it, so alongside exercise and stuff, just having a good cry. And they suggest, you know, that you have a few movies, you know, a list of a few movies that are good to you because for you that you can just sit and have a good cry when you need to sometimes. And I think that's actually really, like, it's such a simple piece of advice, but it's really good advice because sometimes if I'm feeling yucky, I might know that logically that it could be good for me to have a cry, but having a cry is not something that I can just turn on, right? So just the idea of, yeah, having some good movies to, to watch when you need to cry is great advice. Um, what else do they talk about in terms of, uh, in terms of other options? I think those are the main, the main ones. Other ones might come back to me as I talk, but just going back to that thing of differentiating between the stress and the stressor, the stressor. I love the way that they talk about how easy it is to feel like by dealing with the stressor we've dealt with the stress. And so the example they use is say you've got um, a jerky guy at work who's always saying jerky things in your meetings. You know your body wants to reach over the table and scratch that guy's eyes out but you can't do that. It's not appropriate for your working situation and so you sit there, you smile politely, and then you take your supervisor aside later, have a nice, quiet, mature, adult conversation with him about how they might support you better next time this person is making jerking comments. And, you know, you can pat yourself on the back, feel very good about that solution, especially if it works. It's going to prevent you future stress. Um, but in the meantime, from that, that one meeting that you've just had, your body's still soaked in stress juice and you need to do something separate from that dealing with the stressful part to to work that stress out of your system. Uh, because like they say in this book is that staying stuck in that stress response, it doesn't it doesn't just disappear on its own. You know, we can numb out things and it'll kind of dampen down, but it doesn't actually work its way out of our body without us doing something to release it and physically responding completing that's what they're talking about completing that cycle uh so yeah they need to deal with those things separately and i there's so many things that i love about this book and like i say i'm just dealing today i'm just really talking about this first section on on stress and there's so many other great things in there that maybe i'll come back to another day uh but one of the things that I really love about this book is that it really normalizes stress. You know, it doesn't, it's, it's not saying, um, 
you know, just learn how to let it go. Or in fact, it says that that's a dysfunctional response to stress. Um, that's denial, essentially. Um, and it's not encouraging us to somehow create lives that don't have any stress in them because they're saying that stress is actually a normal part of life and well-being is um, not a sort of a state of being. It's actually a state of action where you move in a healthy way in and out of stress states uh, rather than staying stuck in them. And I just think that's really, really useful advice. Um, it, it's in many ways, the ways that they talk about stress is not new. And I think people who are already runners, uh, I know lots of people who are runners who talk about needing to run regularly for their mental health. And so that won't be a surprise to you. But I think that the way that they explain it is really, really clear and really useful. Um, so I, lo I love that it normalizes stress. The other thing that I really love is, so they, they talk not just about, um, not just about, run the run response obviously but the other um one of the other major responses is the fight response so your body decides in a moment without you having any say in the matter uh that this threat could be best dealt with you know you have the best chance of survival by running away from this threat or staying and fighting against this threat and um i think the the fighting one is an interesting one because I think it's a it's an interesting way to think about our bodies deciding that it wants to that that we want to fight somebody uh, without us having a say in it, and I think that that thinking about that and recognizing it and really leaning into that helps will help us to maybe deal with some of our relationships in in activism or or in in fair in our family life all kinds of areas. But let's just focus on activism because I think a lot of us are uncomfortable with the idea that we might want to fight somebody that we have a disagreement with in our meeting say or you know you get a shitty message on email or facebook or whatever that that in some way threatens your sense of membership to the group or somehow makes you feel like you're not respected or whatever M you know many of us are committed to anti-violence and non-violent ways of communicating and stuff like that and Maybe it's a bit challenging, but I think it's actually really freeing to think that our body, you know, our mind might be saying one thing, like deal with this responsibly and be respectful, but our body might be saying something quite different, which is, I want to punch that jerk in the face, or, you know, I want to <laughs> rip that person's throat out or whatever. And if your body's saying that, um, which they're saying in this book, it's saying all the time, you know. Um, I think it's a really healthy and helpful solution to be able to notice that, lean into it and, you know, dance, like, for example, if it's an option, dance around your living room, uh, you know, listening to Black Flag or Beyonce or whatever your jam is and just, you know, shadow boxing the crap out of that person and just let that go from your body, maybe before the next meeting or, you know, before you lie in bed thinking about all the ways that you want to respond to what they said or before you reply to the email. And I, th I think not only is that great for ourselves to be able to just um, not be freaked out by our internal aggression, but I think it could be really good for our collective organizing and stuff, you know. I think it's so, it's so often the case that we communicate in ways with each other that we might be trying to say things very nicely and very productively and supportively and um, respectfully to our collective members, for example. But the if the sort of the energy behind it, the the physical thing in our body, some part of our subconscious or whatever, is actually having the intention of, you know, I I want to beat her, I want to um, defeat her, I'm going to get rid of this threat by conquering her um then i think that intention comes through and i think that that's why often we can you know use a lot of double speak you know like language that language that yeah language that sounds respectful but the actual message coming through is um maybe communicating some really undermining things that can, this is I guess the competitive kind of ness that I talked about in the, 
the first episode about um, you know knowing that you're enough and not expecting everybody to necessarily live up to their activist ideals is that you know it's really easy to fall into that trap of trying to win at being an activist you know like trying to sort of prove to the other person that you know better than them how to be an activist and you know if they weren't um if they were a real anarchist or if they were a real feminist or if they were you know weren't so de- they they weren't so colonized or whatever um they would know like you do that nah, 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 whatever um and <laughs> Yeah, I think if we could all dance that out or recognize it and get it out physically, complete that stress response, then come and deal with the stressor, you know, it could really change. It could change some things in our culture. Um, but yeah, actually, I was, gonna, I was just thinking about in our activist culture, but actually our wider culture as well, right? So that's one of the really exciting things I think about this book. Um, just for me personally, one of the other things that I love about it is that, that idea about our body telling us to run, and so therefore needing to run, is that it changes my relationship to exercise, you know, I, I grew up, uh, in a very sporty town, um, in Taranaki in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I was a awkward, shy um not sporty teenager and I've sort of I have a weird relationship with exercise because of that you know like I've often loved um like you know I really enjoy walking in the bush moving my body dancing um yoga things like that but running is something that I've always felt a bit weird about because um it feels like I've often I've often felt the desire to run but I'm often confronted by the fact that when I go to run, I can't. It's it's too hard. And I, there's feelings of inadequacy or failure or whatever. And I love that with this, you know, you, I can start something like a, um, a program, you know, like one of those little build up to running kind of programs where you, you, for a week, you walk fast for four minutes and then walk slow for a minute you know, for, for a total of 20 minutes. And then, you know, the next week you run for a minute and then walk for four minutes and then run for a minute, you know, like, so you're building up to it. So I can use a system like that, for example, and not feel like, oh, I'm building up to being able to run one day. I can, because if you're not, if you're not a runner already and you're walking fast, you're already completing the stress cycle. You can feel it in your body that your heart's moving and blah, blah, blah. And so I love that it's not sort of exercise for the sake of we're all told all the time that it's good to exercise and we should do this and it's good for our health and stuff. Or or even that we're told, you know, it's good for relieving stress or whatever. The reframing out of my body says run, so I'm going to run. And actually, if I'm just walking, I'm already doing. (laughs) That's really lovely to me, you know, like that feels really joyful and internal and um, not pressured and stuff. So. I really like that as well, and that might resonate with some of you who are not already uh, runners. I think this book is worth getting or reading. You don't have to buy it. I'll put a link below where you can buy it, but I think um, if you can't afford to buy it, you know, at least here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, public libraries are really, really good at taking suggestions, so you could uh, go hit up your library. Another way, speaking of that collective way of doing it, is to maybe, uh, you know, go ways with members of your collective or your workplace and you know make a commitment together to to responding differently to stress and being honest about our stress uh i like that yeah i like this book a, a lot i can't recommend it enough yeah take care of yourself and each other and i will see you next time Noho my.